So one thing, uh, if you're using this notebook like I am, be sure to hit, um, you can hit stop or this little fast forward button, which will actually rerun the entire document. So if you're used to R, this will be like rerunning the entire script. Just to make sure you have everything open, it's active, currently being used in your environment. Um, otherwise, um, it'll look like the code is there and have run, but it won't be active, I meaning we can't inter interact with it. Do turn off the download. You only needed to do that once. Once you have it, you're done. So we did that. And so we, we imported um, several different text pieces by telling it to open the book part of the package. And so we've got these texts already preloaded. And later we'll talk about how you pull in corpora. That's a different chapter. But we're going to start with some basics. And this also hopefully ease you into Python if you're not familiar. Okay, so I'm going to tell it to print. This just shows me which text it is as opposed to printing the entirety of Moby Dick, which would be very long. Now the search text, um, what we might use is the concordance function. This is a really easy little function that allows us to find specific words in a text. Later we're going to get to regular expressions, which is a way that we can find specific combinations of words in a text. So you might be looking for a specific phrase or you know any version of the word um, monstrous, like monstrous, monstrous Lee, and like other uh, form, similar forms, uh, morphemes of the same word. And the way this works is, and at the beginning here, I have most of the functionality, if you're, especially if you're not familiar, um, kind of set up where it shows you the thing that you have to change in italics and the things that should stay the same in regular text. Um, and so what I want to do is I'm going to use the name of a variable. And that needs to be an NLTK object, meaning it's a text object that we're going to look through. Um, concordance is a kind of a word of like find all of the times that this happens. And then we've got whatever we're looking for. So if I do text one, remember that's Moby Dick dot concordance, I can find the word monstrous because it's talking about how big the whale is. Um, or the example I think we did was cheese. You can see uh, unexpectedly there are more, the word cheese is in here. Um, or we could look up a monstrous cheese. Monstrous. We found the word monstrous again, okay. And I bet the word cheese is not paired with it. Nope. So when things don't, uh, pairs don't occur next to each other, it'll just tell you no matches. Actually, cheese is one of my favorite examples, <laughs> so it's not always the most uh, easy thing to remember which class, because I used cheese literally yesterday in an example. So, <clears throat> um, Similar function allows you to look for the uh, words that match the use of another word. Okay. So it's kind of like searching for synonyms. Um, we'll use synonyms later when we talk about WordNet, but similar tells me words that occur in the same context. And if they occur around the same context, then they must have similar meanings. Uh, there's a very famous phrase called, um, uh, you know a word by the company that it keeps, so the words that are around it. And so if we look up the text of the similar words to monstrous in Moby Dick, we get, um, a couple of strange words like Christian here. Um, and I think that's a, I can't remember if that's a person or the, the sort of literal, um, like if it's a, a person's name or if it's the literal use of it, meaning God, right, kind of Christian. Um, but we also see loving, wise, doleful, gamesome, like there's some odd words here, but they occur in the same context. So it's kind of similar um, in the sense Okay, on my end it looks okay, I think. It's not broken, it's just got the Jupiter part in it. Is anybody else seeing that? If somebody else is seeing it wonky, I can start it and restart, stop it and restart it. But it does just have this 
Jupiter piece in the middle. Today's going to be our comedy of errors today. Okay, sure, I can, uh, I think the only solution is to hit stop, do a little dance, try again, hit share. I mean, it looks the same to me, but hopefully that's fixed for you guys. Um, lost the mouse. Okay, I'm just going to put the comments over here, so I'll have to look down. Okay. <clears throat> If I look for words that are similar to monstrous in text number two, now text number two, sense of sensibility, um, I see actually like happy words, right? Good, heartily, great, extremely, remarkably. And so what we see is a difference in their usages. Okay? And so this gets us into like some very basic ideas of sentiment, where um, the way a word is used is going to change in meaning based on um, the words around it. That was my dog sneezing. Okay, it's a weird day in this house. Um, and so um, what we can see is if we look at the similar words in two different texts, we can tell a little bit about sentiment because monstrous normally is kind of a negative connotation, but clearly in sense and sensibility, it's a more of a positive connotation. Yes, wait till chapter three. <laughs> so um, uh, semantic relatedness of a similarity, well, we can get to when we look at WordNet and um, a couple of other packages. Um, not right now, but we will get there, yes. <clears throat> um, another option is to look at common context. So this is actually a kind of a, an answer to your question. Um, it's not a perfect answer to your question because you, you're probably wanting more of a number. But what we could do is um, look at the overlap in their similarities. And so you put in two words uh, that you're interested in opposed to two texts. So we can probably do this with text one and text two, but we can do this with two concepts. And what it will do is tell you the times that those are shared together. So I guess you could count the length, like how many times are they shared together? And so the common context, the where these words are used in the same way, um, is pretty glad, lucky, uh, is pretty versus a pretty. So like this would be a pretty monstrous or a very pretty blah, blah, blah. So they're used around the same words. So that might kind of answer your question, um, but they would need to be in the same text. Now what we can do in looking at text across time, so to speak, um, is create a dispersion plot. So a dispersion plot has um, not time in the sense of like TikTok, but like uh, the, the text across words uh, down in the bottom and then the frequency is measured by just putting a little slash like a little tally every time you see it and then you can put several words together to look at how they are used either in the same context or not now to get this to display in jupyter i had to import the display function there's this other little package you might have to install i think in general it should work fine without installing anything extra um, but if it doesn't, you can try troubleshooting using some of this stuff. So we'll put in the name of one of our variables, text one, text two, create a dispersion plot. Sorry, I didn't mean to double click, I meant to highlight. Um, and then put in the words that we're wanting to use. So these should be in italics. So I imported the display option. Now I imported matplotlib. Uh, a while back, and that allows me to blow up the figure. If you don't use this uh, plot figure option, let me show you how it comes out. Like it's totally unreadable. Blah. So instead, what we'll do is use plt.figure. Now, plt comes from importing matplotlib library um, in the first or second uh, chunk. 
These numbers are inches. I know it doesn't look like it, my text output here. Um, so don't make it like 100 because your computer, it'll lock up. But we could make it bigger if we wanted. Now let's see, 15 by 12. Um, unfortunately, without some extra fancy code, it doesn't blow up the text, but there's ways to do that as well. Mainly, I just want you to get the general gist here. So we're going to take text 4, which is the inaugural address corpus. So this is all of um, the presidential addresses that we have up until Obama number 1, maybe? Maybe number 2? Um, create a dispersion plot of the words citizens, democracy, freedom, duties, and America. And that's what these are. So here's citizens, democracy, freedom, duties, and America. Each little tick mark is an instance of that word. And what we can see is that citizenship kind of comes and goes. So it becomes really popular during certain eras, kind of fades out, and then has become more popular as we're talking about immigration here in the United States. Um, democracy was not really a word until uh, later. Freedom really picks up towards the end, especially during the Bush II era. Duties actually drops off. So freedom and duties are sort of exchange places, and America becomes like much more of an important word later. Okay. Now this would be better if we actually looked at it across um, by time, but effectively this is time because these um, inaugural addresses are in order. So this is just like every inaugural address pasted one after another. So the word here is just the literal word count from starting from zero. But the nice thing about this is we can look at these trends in what is an important meaning to the document. Um, and we can clearly see that the use of the phrase America has really picked up. Um, in the text, there's this really cool function called generate. It talks about it um, in the textbook. It's gone, so you can't use it uh, if you're reading along. But now some functions that we will use so many times you'll get tired of them, okay? So the length function uh, counts the number of, of things in an object. And in this particular case, it's the number of text, uh, the number of words in the text. If you ha And that's because uh, text 3 is tokenized. Okay, but tokenized, I mean, it is a list of words. Um, so NLTK objects, text objects, are a list of, of character strings that represent words. If you pull in an object that is a, an entire paragraph, the length function will then tell you how many characters it is. So you have to be a little careful here on what the length function is actually measuring, because if it's a list, it counts the number of objects in a list. If it's a string, it counts the number of characters. So text three, which was census sensibility. No, I've already forgotten. Text three. Ah, no, Genesis. So we'll leave both of those on there. Okay. So Genesis, the Bible, uh, the book in the Bible, is uh, 40, almost 45,000 words long. And so kind of to remember, this slide's huge. I don't know what happened. Um, some important things that we learned in the previous lecture. Tokens are a sequence of characters that we treat as a group. So length here is going to tell us the number of words. But types are the unique words. So the set function allows us to create a unique list of objects. And so all the duplicates are just sort of collapsed together. Um, <clears throat> And one thing we might have to deal with later when we talk about text processing, when we look at how we actually create these tokenized lists, is uh, punctuation. We're going to kind of deal with punctuation because if it's treating a word that has a period as a different than the word that doesn't have the period, that's obviously not appropriate. So what I'll do is do set, uh, I'll hit enter, set, and then the name of the variable that we want to run. So if we did set text three, we would get all of the words, unique words in text three. And then if you wanted to see those in alphabetical order, 
you would use the sorted function. Okay. So sorted um, creates an alphabetical list. Not to be confused with R's sort function, which is how I know I've been playing in Python for too long, is when I go back to R and try to use sorted. Um, and then it doesn't work. Now, I'm going to run this um, to a number. Uh, in this particular case, these are prepackaged objects, so numbers are treated as individual words. Later, when we talk about how to process your own text, it's up to you how you deal with it. Generally, numbers are treated as their own separate word, because technically they are words, they're just special types. So let me fix this slide issue just real quick, like, so we can actually see this text. There we go. Right. So I'm going to print this out. Mostly I have it turned off because um, otherwise when you print these slides, it prints the entirety of Genesis, which is quite long. Um, so I'll try not to do that. But you can see this is every unique word. Um, in alphabetical order. Now it does treat capitals as a separate thing, so all the capitals go first. Now here's your, some of your numbers, 12, 2, um, and then all the lower cases go first. So we probably want to combine lower cases and uppercase um, combinations into one word. We'll talk about how to do that later, but these are all of the words in Genesis. I'm gonna turn that bad boy off though. And if I look at the unique words, so we said there were 45-ish thousand words, there's only 2,700 or 2,800 unique words. So kind of a big difference there. And that leads us to a measure of lexical richness or lexical diversity. It's the um, types to token ratio. So in Genesis, what I do is take the length of the set meaning the types, to the number of tokens. And I get that there is a 6% of lexical diversity or 6% lexical richness. What that means is that only 6, like 6% 6 of the words are unique. Now there's no like rule on what needs to be unique or not. This really just allows you to compare across documents. So we're doing a project where we're looking at political rhetoric and um, we looked at a bunch of different major news sources to see what their lexical diversity was with this sort of predefined assumption on what uh, bias, this predefined bias, I would say, of what do, what um, news sources might be more lexically diverse, and definitely we're wrong. So you might think that NPR is more diverse than Fox. You would be wrong. <laughs> um, and so a quick pass over it shows that they are fairly different in that Fox uses more distinct words without a whole lot of processing. So without with some with some uh, stimming and limitization, which we'll get more into, they might end up being the same. But kind of a quick and dirty types to tokens ratio, um, Fox was actually more diverse. <clears throat> now the count function does exactly what it sounds like, counting. And so you do um, this if you're an R person and for if you're more used to working in R, this is to me one of the weirder things to get used to is um, the fact that you do like the function isn't around the variable. It's variable dot function often. Okay. And so to get anything to print in Jupyter, if you have multiple outputs, it only prints the last one. Um, so you will definitely need to tell things to print if you have multiple ones. So up here, I had to tell these two to print so we would see them, and then it actually printed the last one without me telling it. Unlike R, which prints everything ever. Right? If it's going to print out, you're going to see it. Um, at least in Jupyter, the interpretation is that you only want the last one. Right? Or otherwise, why'd you put it in there? So text.3. Right, count. We're going to count the number of the word number of times the word smote appears because this is the Bible. We're going to print out the number of times divided by the length to just get a proportion of the number of times it appears. I'm sorry, a, a percent. And so it occurs five times in Genesis, and that's 
0.01%. So very small number. Um, it's a word that people like to pick on though because it's one we don't tend to use anymore. In comparison, the, the letter A as a word um, is used uh, 1.4 times in the English translation of this stuff anyway. So um, you can't ex necessarily expect a particular word to be used maybe more than 5 to 10 percent because the, which is more is the most common word in the English language, um, is used 6 percent of the time. So we can kind of play with how often we might expect different words. So the, an, and a are definitely the most popular. Um, we might get some action with of. It's going to be one, a big one. Um, I did in. Okay. So our helper words here, our prepositions and our determinants um, or articles are the, the most frequent. So this is still small, but it's not unreasonably small given that the largest percent is probably 6%. All right. So if we want to calculate a, a long list, so lots of different words, instead of me just sitting there like looping over them one at a time, we could write our own function. Okay. So when we're writing our own functions, which we'll do a lot this year, you use def, D-E-F for define. Um, don't use function names you've already encountered. This is bad coding. It will let you do this, um, but don't do that. So, um, it, uh, so don't think, do things like a uh, link, len for length or print. So don't overwrite a base function. Basically, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the spacing here is important, but Jupyter understands this kind of spacing and kind of auto does it for you. Um, so. I will show you that here in a second. But when you create code blocks and you're running loops or um, creating functions, you actually have to tab them over. But almost every IDE or writing interpreter kind of figures out that that's what you're doing when you use a colon. Now the name of objects to expect are called arguments. And jokingly, sometimes they're called quarks, which just makes me laugh every time I hear someone say it for arguments that are sort of undefined. Um, but these are things that you expect a user to fill in. Um, so let's look at one here. And so you can see it's already tabbed over, but if I already typed def, let's say I wanted to define cheese as something to eat. Right. When I have a colon and I hit enter, Jupyter kind of like, oh, you're gonna write a function, or oh, you're gonna write a loop, and auto tabs over. That's on purpose. Now, when you are done writing your function, you will have to sort of escape from the tabbing. So let's say I just wanted to return yum. And so I could define this function, and then I could use it. I actually don't have to put anything in there because um, I put a text file in here, but I didn't use it. So notice how I have this argument, but then it's never used in here. Now, why didn't it print? It didn't print because I'm printing something later. This is that rule about if it's not the last object, it won't print. So now you'll see that it printed the word yum. Okay. But that's not really what I want to do. I want to define a lexical diversity function, which is our lexical richness. So I'm going to return 100% times the um, length here, so the um, types to tokens. And notice that it's just called text. Text is here as a placeholder that just says that the user should input some sort of text. Okay. Now we're not getting super fancy if you take taking some courses in Python and, tell, and, and writing in all the um, sort of background information that would help people <laughs> actually know what your function does. Um, so we're assuming that you're writing these for yourself and you can remember what they're doing, but there are ways to write better functions where you can um, define what all the arguments are and have it print. Okay. But let's say I've defined it as inputting a text and it will calculate lexical diversity as a percent. And so then I put in text three and it's 6% like we did earlier. 
I could also write a function that would define the percent of uh, text that a particular word is. So I could tell it to um, input a count and input a total and return the count divided by the total. So I could count and then the total. And there would be an even better way to loop over each word than this, but this is kind of, we haven't gotten to loops yet, so this is kind of a basic function. So I could then change it to the and get 6%. What are you doing? I am screwing this up. Go away. I just was trying to type the letter A. I don't know what combination of values I hit that made it angry. There we go. <clears throat> so um, let's talk a little bit why, what was this about? Mm. Oh, applying all of it at once. So. Let's say I made an example list. Okay, so this is a list. The square brackets indicate that it's a, a list of objects. Um, so I've just got some text here. Uh, I can print that out. I can print sentence one. Sentence one is sentence one of Moby Dick. I can calculate the length of sentence one. It's got four words. Okay, I can calculate the length of my example as well. It also has um four words it didn't change because they're the same then i could print the lexical diversity of sentence one um which is uh a hundred percent because it's four unique words so the purpose of talking about lists is that lists are the workhorse of python they're like the thing that runs Python. Once you get into, if you if you continue on Python, you're going to get into pandas, which is about data frames, and that becomes um, kind of the, the the data science version for Python. But right now, we're mostly just going to focus on lists because if you can handle lists, you can handle most most other things. So with lists, what we can do is we can add them together. So if I say sentence four plus sentence one concatenates them together or combines them together, like the C function in R. I can add new things to the list by using the append function. I can use the index function to find things in the list using numbers and slicing. We'll talk a little bit more about slicing later. But so let's just look at the append function. So if I say sentence one, that was call me Ishmael, and added the word sum to it, um, what we see is that now it prints out call me Ishmael and then just the word sum at the end. And that keeps it permanently in there because when I reram this last slide, this word sum popped up because it had already run previously. Um, I could tell it to print sentence one. Turn this off real quick. Um, so it ran and added another word sum. So the more times we run this, the more it's going to add the word sum to the end. Uh, now I can run sentence one plus sentence four, and then it's run off the screen, but essentially it prints out those two sentences added together. Oops, sorry. All right. So indexing allows you to find a specific spot. So this is really useful if you're trying to clean up some code or some, some text and you know that there is a specific spot in the text where the information you want starts. So this is going to be useful for our Project Gutenberg um, examples that we're going to do in a couple weeks. Now here's the big kicker if you have not, if you've not programmed with a zero index language before. R is a one index language. Um, and then Python, things like C++, are zero index languages, meaning that um, the first row or item or column is zero. I learned Perl a million years ago. It's a zero index language. It's always made me crazy. One index language makes more sense. I understand the computer science view of this, but whatever. The first item is one, zero, but whatever. Okay. Python is a zero index language. Um, and this, if you've never done it before, is confusing. 
because 173 gives you the 174th item. And the idea behind this is it's the number of steps away from zero that you've taken. So it's often related to like um, to walking or to stairways, right? The first step is off the, uh, off the floor. If, um, the, 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 z the floor is zero and the first step up is one. Uh, this is actually true um, of like elevators in other countries like Europe where zero is the main floor and negative one is the basement and um, one is the, the second you know floor up or the first floor is the first one up from the main floor. Okay. Um, so at the 174th item is the word awaken. If we use dot index we can find the word awaken um, is 173. So index tells you where the first instance of something is located. Okay. So if I do the word V here, okay. it only shows me that it's the fifth item. So and that the word V definitely occurs more than once. So index tells you the first time something happens. It doesn't tell you every instance, which is a different function. Slicing is um, a way to pick a certain set of objects from a list. And so, again, I'm going to relate this to R because I assume most of you have gone through the basic four courses that talk about R. So, um, slicing is like when you pick a subset of columns or a subset of rows. So, if you wanted items 5 through 10 in a list, you could say, um, you could use the colon indicator instead of saying 5, then 6, then 7. So this allows you to pick them all at once. This is another thing that makes me not so bonkers about Python is that the colon icon, the double dots here, gives you up to the last point. Okay. So if I say I want 5 colon 10, what it's going to give me is 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's 5 through up to 10, but not including it. Cool. <laughs> I have never liked that. I screw this up all the time. Um, but if you leave the number blank before the colon, you get the beginning of the list. So blank colon four is zero, one, two, three. So it gives you up four items effectively, but zero, one, two, three. And the reverse is true for um, leaving it blank after. It gives you up, uh, gives you um, up to the end. So I have a list of things that counts 1 through 10, but realize that the list of things indexes are 0 through 9. I can tell it to print me the uh, 1 index, which will give me 2, because 0, um, 1 here is the 0th index, 2 is the first index. If I ask it to give me 0 through 4, it's going to give me 1, 2, 3, and 4, because the fourth index is 5. If I ask it to give me 5 through 10, that's going to give me start at 6, which is the fifth index. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, fifth index, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, through 10. Okay. So um, slicing can get really, really complicated. Like you can slice by character, you can slice like triple slice. I try to keep it simple where I'm only like, give me these columns or these rows or these objects. Um, I try not to like, character slice too often because then it gets, it gets super confusing. Okay, so some quick reminders about saving your variables to use again later. Don't use reserve words. These are things like for, um, try not to use function words, print, length, uh, def is a reserve word. So uh, essentially don't use reserve words. Don't start with a number. Capitalization does matter, so it treats capital word different than lowercase words. No spaces or minus signs. Underscores and dots are allowed. So everything we've done so far has been a list of character strings, um, but we can work with number strings and we can add or multiply or slice them and go nuts. So if I take a character string and I multiply it by 2, it's actually just going to repeat that character string twice, which to me is a nice function.
But let's get into um, just some basic statistics. Okay. There's actually no mean function in base Python. Um, if you are familiar with NumPy, you can import that package and play with that. But if you are familiar, remember the mean is calculated by summing and dividing by the total. So when I ask you to calculate means, just sum and divide by the total. Um, but it just it blows my mind. Because Python is not was not really, I guess, originally designed to be a statistics language, whereas R was. And so it's kind of interesting. There's no mean function. Um, but a function in uh, NLTK that we're going to use all semester, so get the hang of it now, is freakdist. So the frequency distribution function is simply a table with one piece that um, is the thing that you're counting. Okay, it could be words, it could be numbers, and then the count. Okay. So this is literally all it's making is a, what's called a frequency distribution or a table of what the word is and how many times it occurs, or what the part of speech is and how many times it occurs, or whatever. Okay. And the way that you run that is you run frequency distribution um on whatever variable you're using and then you can tell it to print out the most common or the top most popular options so count them up tell me the top 20. put a big old star here this is a question that's on the first couple of homeworks that everyone just gets like totally stuck on it's, it's like create this list of most popular words and print out the top 20. I swear I see like all these crazy answers and I'm like, there's a function for this, most common, which tells me the top of the distribution. So what I'm going to do is take text one, which is Moby Dick, run a frequency distribution on it. So that's going to give me every word in Moby Dick and count how many times all the words occur. So the word the should be very close to the top. And I'm going to save it. Um, and we have to save these so we can use them. I could print the frequency distribution, but what you'll see is that it just kind of tells you what kind of object it is. It doesn't really print the table. Okay, so that's not very handy. So instead, I might do most common to print the top 10. Check this out. We've got something new going on here. We've got the, the list icon. So lists are square brackets, but now we have this new um, regular parentheses set here. And these are called tuples. Now, get it out of your head. I don't know if this is because I, I'm a native English speaker, but forever I thought tuples meant two pairs. <laughs> um, it just happens to sound like the word two. It's spelled T-U-P-L-E-S. Um, so tuples can be of any length. Um, they're denoted with, with parentheses, your norm, normal parentheses. And tuples are non-changeable. Uh, so there are reasons for them, and they are very useful, and we'll get more into that as we kind of wade into Python here. But this is a list of pairs, um, specifically pairs because I've got the word, which is in this case is a comma, and then the number of times it occurs, um, and then the. So you see the, of, and, a, and two are the most popular words. We don't have any nouns here at the top. Uh, that's a list of pairs. And so that's a frequency table. And here are the most common words in Moby Dick. And those first words are, those words here are called the worker bees of language sometimes. They're prepositions, determinants, conjunctions. These are the, the words that hold up the language. Often we're not really totally interested in them because we're more interested in the sentiment, which is going to be determined by the, the meanings of the nouns, the verbs. But those are the words that sort of keep the language together, so to speak. Um, if we want to know about a specific instance of a word, we can take that frequency distribution that we've saved and say, well, tell me about how many times a whale occurs. And it's 900 times, which is kind of a lot. And this is not a word that's going to appear that often in sens sensibility, if at all, right? Um, so you can actually look up specific words as well as just tell me the top 10. Excuse me. Just had a yawn. 
So a noun that's occurring that many times is quite is a big deal. Um, and we can create uh, a frequency distribution picture by using the plot function. So instead of just a table, we can plot them. Oh, yes. Good question. We haven't gotten into lowercasing yet. So it actually is occurring over a thousand times. Um, and this, it would be better if we first lowercased it and then made the frequency distribution, but we haven't gotten the loops yet. So we're kind of trying to do one little Python piece at a time. But great question. Uh, so back to the plot function. The plot function uh, is, it's not meant to be a histogram function because here we're talking about um, word frequencies and not like word distributions. But we could also use this to make histograms. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't want to call this a histogram because it is not one. It kind of looks like one, but it's not a histogram in the sense of that I would use this to understand means and standard deviations. So we're going to take our name of our variable, which is going to be fdist here, plot it, tell it how many items to plot, and here we'll do a cumulative plot. So let's look at this. So again, I told it to make my plot big. Every time you plot something, you have to use this uh, argument if you want to be able to read it. Here's the name of my te saved text. Plot the first 50. Cumulative equals true, and so we can see this nice um, power function where the first several words make up right, mo the majority of the text. And then this is really tiny down here, but these are the, the words, the first 50 words in order. Um, we could also do that the other way, where cumulative equals false, and we see that V has is a lot of words and then the other ones kind of tail off. This particular kind of grass, graph is the demonstration of what's called Zipf's law. It's Zip, Z-I-P with an F at the end. Um, some of people call it Zipf's law, but it's like Zipf's, right? I think it's German, PF combination. Um, and Zipf's law argues that the most frequent word is um, twice or more as frequent than the next frequent word, which is twice or more as frequent as the word after that, etc. So it creates this like 1 over x, so this inverse power function, this like, nice um, L-shaped function. Right? And Zipf's law is used for just frequencies in language, and that is almost always true, where you calculate the most frequent words, and they're going to be way more frequent than the next word, which is more frequent, uh, twice as frequent as the next one, as the next one, etc. And kind of thinking about these plots, it appears that there's a lot of worker words that take up the majority of the text. So if we wanted word content, we really got to think about words that are less frequent. Uh, and sometimes we can consider what are called hapaxes or the least frequent words. And these are things that appear only once in the text. So there's a specific function to get the bottom of a frequency distribution where the count for the second half of the tuple is one, okay. which is also a filterable or subsetable, so to speak, because we could just tell it to give us the bottom or tell us to loop over and only show us the ones that are one, but there's actually already a function for this. Okay. I noticed I didn't put anything in the middle, so no argument here, and then I told it to slice me the first ten. Okay. And then these will be kind of in a random order, whatever order they kind of appear in in text. And what we see is the person's, from a Melville, the writer's name is first, and that's actually closed bracket, it's not part of the, the list. And then these words that are only used once. And so now let's get into loops. So I want to subset, I want to find specific criteria in the data. So I might look for words that are all 15 characters or longer, or I might look for all the words that start with um, Q, 
for all the WH words for who, what, where, why kinds of questions. Um, and, you know, in R, we have a lot of options. Like if you're tidyverse person, you might use some sort of filter option. If you're base R person, you might use a subset function. And you kind of have some rules there. And what that does internally is loops over each one and finds them. In Python, you just have to write the loop yourself. Um, so we're going to do a combination of if and for loops. Okay, so the if function is just a true kind of false statement to determine um, if something is met. So is it a WH word? The for function, um, are called for loops, takes some sort of iterable object meaning that you can loop over it. So some objects you can loop over and some objects you cannot. And believe me, when you can't, it'll tell you. Um, I think the argument is the object is not iterable. But it'll take some sort of set, a list, a frequency distribution, which is just a giant list. Um, uh, I think you can loop over dictionaries okay. uh, and just those one at a time. So a very simple loop, if I say 4x, in range 0 to 3. Okay. So range just counts from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3. Okay. So I said 4x from 0 to 3, print x. So what's happening is on each uh, run of the loop, the first time x is 0, and the second time x is 1, and then it counts up all the way through 3. And so it is going to fill in the the sequence, it kind of is like uh, the function in R is like sequence along. Um, and um, essentially just creates a, a counter at the moment. Okay. Generally, that's not what we want to do. We want to get more fancy. So let's get fancy. I'm going to create a, a list of all the unique tokens in Moby Dick. Okay, I'm just going to call it V. And I'm going to look for, ooh, that was weird. Um, a specific set of only long words. So let's work kind of uh, backwards on this loop um, that I think will help you understand what's going on. Uh, so first thing, if length of the word is greater than 15, hopefully this is obvious right here, check it out. So if the word length is greater than 15, by putting in a single token into the length function, it's going to count the number of characters. So it's not going to return one because there's only one word. It's going to return the length of each word, okay. um, which is the number of characters. So if the word is more than 15, stick it in this list. Okay. So see here, this um, the outsides are the list function. In V here means we're looping over V, which we just created. So looking in V, if the length of the words are over 15, stick it in the list. And here we've looped over the words. So four words in V. So for each word in V here, tell me if the length of the word is more than 15. Now the one in the front is the weird one. So what you're doing here is telling it what you want it to return. Okay, give me the word word, give me the word as I loop through words, if it's more than 15 characters. You can also kind of write that like this. Um, I, I personally like this indented options uh, because to me, this makes sense. So looping over the words, if it's more than 15 characters, return it. So to me, this is a bit more that kind of typed out like this is a bit clearer. But I want to show you guys this way because um, there are Python purists in the world who think that this is the best way to write uh, for loops with ifs because then it's all in one line and it's clear and it's easy to read. And I totally disagree. But um, when you like are trying to tr troubleshoot, this is the sort of code that you're going to find. So you can actually do it either way. Um, that's fine. So we could not even return the word. So here's another way you do this. Okay. I would start an empty list. 
And then what I would do is add, so append, go back to the function we used a minute ago, and add that new word to the end of the list. Okay, this would give us the same output as this. So we went from one line to four. So people are like, ah, it's too long. And I'm like, look, it's so much clearer. I'll leave that in there. But what this does is it loops over all these words and gives us all the long words and then I sorted them and now we can see all the 15 character or more words in Moby Dick, which is quite a, is, is uh, more, than a, more than a few. This is another way to do that. <clears throat> Let's try a different text and create a more complicated function or a looping function. And I'll kind of do the same thing here and show you how this function is working. Um, I can create a frequency distribution of text five. Text five is a um, chat corpus. Uh, and then what we're doing here is we're going to, we're just going to tell it to print. So we're not even going to save it. So we're going to do W for W in set five. If the length is greater than seven and the frequency distribution is more than seven. Okay. So what we're going to do is basically looping over words in the set of words from text five, only give me the word back if the length of the word is greater than seven. We can use and here, or we could say then if the length, um, the frequency, I'm sorry, the frequency of that particular word is greater than seven, print that word out. Okay. Now this particular function won't sort anything. Here I have them sorted. But this is the same code. So it's looping over the words and set in the set of words in five, text five. If the length of that word is longer than seven and its frequency is at least seven, so check out this frequency thing. Um, then give us the word back. What we should see, um, outside function, why did that be rude? It should have worked. Return outside function. Oh, is it not return? It's print. I'm sorry, it's print. There we go. We should see, we'll see the same output. Well, let me fix that. Where did I do the other one? Oh, I appended, so it's okay. Sorry. Print, not return. This is not a function. So these two give us the same answer. Okay. Um, and I'm okay with you using either one. I'm just telling you when you go to search or look up how do I find all the seven letter words, you'll see this kind of code. Um, I'm not a Python purist. Code that is your own, right? Don't copy code from other people directly and not edit it it okay um and by edited i mean don't just change the names of the variables like edit the code um these two uh give you the same answer all right um getting into now working with the text rather than just some basic descriptives Let's look at um, collocations and bigrams. So collocations are sequence of words that occur together frequently. Sometimes they're called collexemes. Um, sometimes they're just called bigrams when we mean two, or ingrams, meaning unigram is one, bigram is two, trigram is three, etc. Um, so something like peanut butter is a bigram. The bigram function allows us to take a text and turn it all into bigrams. And so what that does, if we say more is said than done, it converts that into a list of tuples where it's more is, is said, said than, than done. Now with the list of tuples, I can now loop over it and create a frequency distribution of those tuple lists. So the reason that you'd use this function is if you wanted to calculate all of the two word pairs, you could convert them into two word pairs and then do all these other functions that we've talked about, frequency distributions, links, etc. Um, 
And to do that, um, we could, sorry, I just said this. Uh, the collocations function actually will show us the most frequent bigrams. So we don't even have to like reinvent the wheel and create these loops. We could just say, give us the collocations. Um, you can also tell it the number of collocations you want to print as well as the window size. Although I can't get window size to work correctly, so I'm not sure that that function works quite right. Okay. So I could tell it text for give me the most popular collocations. And so the answer is United States, fellow citizens. This is the inaugural address corpus. All right. um, you can also tell it to print. I blank space. I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to make this a separate slide so we can see it a little better. There we go. Um, this just gives me a blank space. If you want to understand what the function is doing, you can say help and it will show you some of the options. So it says I could print 20, the window size default is 2, but I have tried this. Let's tell it num equals 10, window size equals 3, and it does nothing useful. Right? It still gives me two United States. So I don't know that window size actually works. Yep. Because, you know, I've changed it to something other than two, and it still only gives me two. So, in theory, window size gives you more. In practice, I don't think it does. But um, also, too, here, uh, it defaults to 20. So if you want to see more, you have to tell it, give me 100, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, this was me proving to you that it doesn't work. So instead, maybe I want to do something different. And let's think about readability. So readability is a function of the length of the words in a document and the number of um, the number, the length of the words, the number of words, and the number of sentences, and the sort of word to sentence ratio. Are they really long sentences or are they really short sentences? So doing starting somewhere simple, let's just think about word links. And let's look at a frequency distribution of word links. So this is going to kind of combine many things together. Okay. Um, we could also think about the max frequency. Um, and so let's start by creating a frequency distribution. Check it out. So we're doing our little loop again. 4w in text 1, return or give me back the length of each word. Okay. And if I tell it to print that frequency distribution, I can see that three letter words here. Now this is actually a dictionary, but we're going to hold and not explain dictionaries until a couple weeks from now. But notice that this is like a curly brackets instead of a list. But what's in the frequency distribution says that the three letter words occur 50,000 times. One letter words occur 47,000 times. Uh, four letter words 42, etc. So this is counting the length of the words instead of the words themselves. And I can kind of make a cool set of plots so I can print the most common so the 10 most common links, 3, 1, 4, 2, 5, 6, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, I can print the max. So which of that frequency distribution is the most common? Right. So this would be like doing most common number one. Okay. So that's three here. I can tell it to print um, the frequency of three which is very low. Uh, frequency, the third one, one, two, zero, one, two, three. Okay, I'm not sure, actually, let me back up. Let's look at what frequency does. Uh, frequency, the thing that you're looking for, actually. So it's telling me the probability here of the three letter option. So it's 20% of the text almost. And then I can make a cool plot. Now the problem I have with this plot is it's actually graphing them in most common to least common order, but since these are numbers, it would probably be better to give us a nice histogram plot, um, but we can plot it. 
this one this will be a difficult plot to read because it's not in like numerical order all right then just a couple of more i think this is like very the end here um a couple more uh options that you can do and i think these are probably best read actually looking at it in this format uh, because when you convert to markdown, it loses some of the spacing. So some other things that I can do um, in my if function, so I can do less than, less than, or equal to, equal to, check out equal to, it's two equal signs uh, because we're not setting something equal to four, we're checking if it's equal to four. So this is like using double question marks effectively. Not equal to, greater and greater than equal to, down here is our bigger list of, oh, that gets way too tiny, okay. options. So we can do starts with, so it doesn't start with the letter T, ends with, okay. is this um, substring in the other substring? So I can say is cheese in cheese whiz, that sort of thing. Um, here's our lowercase. This is a question though, is lower is upper is alpha is alphanumeric um is digit is title so all of these are ways to ask questions to put into our if functions when we get into some of the later chapters we'll talk about manipulating the text itself so creating lowercase and uppercase um, to convert them all to the same style before we start working with the text